Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 339 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing Resolution, Spring, and The Analyst, a trio of low budget horror movies written and directed by Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead. And this one involves spoilers for all three movies, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Sarah Lynn Mishner, making her eighth appearance on the show. She's a Ravenclaw Trekkie maker feminist who writes at Medium and crafts laser-cut jewelry and soap with swear words inside. She lives in Northern California with a Renaissance engineer, a dog, and a bird. So Sarah, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Then next up, we've got Chris Savasco, making his seventh appearance on the show. From 2003 to 2009, he was the editor of Paradox, the magazine of historical and speculative fiction, and his short fiction has appeared in Nightmare Magazine, Black Static, and Beneath Ceaseless Skies, as well as in the anthologies Shades of Blue and Gray, Ghost of the Civil War, and Zombies Shambling Through the Ages. He's also written a psychological thriller about Lady Godiva, a wartime resistance thriller set immediately after the Norman Conquest, and a political thriller involving the murder of King Edward the Martyr, all of which he's currently shopping around to agents. So, Chris, welcome to the show. Good to be back. And also joining us today is Andrea Kale, who you may remember from our panel on The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina back in episode 337, our panel on Disenchantment back in episode 324, and our panel on Game of Thrones spoilers back in episode 146. She's a graduate of the Odyssey Writers Workshop, and her short fiction appears in the Writers of the Future anthology, Fantasy Magazine, and Lightspeed. She's also a television writer and producer, and was the script supervisor for Late Night with Conan O'Brien. So, Andrea, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. Okay, so these three movies that we're going to talk about, I think, have been a little bit beneath the radar. I did not hear about Resolution or Spring at all when they came out. And I only heard about The Endless because I was just randomly browsing the iTunes charts. And I just came across this movie, and it said it was, I think it was 94% on Rotten Tomatoes, and it was in the sci-fi fantasy category. And it's just kind of like, how is there a sci-fi fantasy movie that's 94% on Rotten Tomatoes that I've never heard of at all? So that really intrigued me. So uh, I got. That's got exactly bunch... how I how I uncovered it as well. <laughs> yeah, so so I got a bunch of friends together at Andrea's apartment. So thank you, Andrea, for letting us use your apartment for that. No problem. And watched it. And I was like, wow, this is actually really good. And so then I saw that the same filmmakers had another movie called Spring. So we got a bunch of other friends together and watched that. And I was like, wow, this is really good too. And I was hoping to do another one to watch Resolution, and I just we haven't had time to do it. But so I had to watch that one all by myself. Um, but that was that was good too. So um, yeah, I'm really impressed that there are these movies. They're all fairly, as I said, fairly low budget movies. Um, from you know, these are the first three movies that these uh, these guys have made. Uh, so I just think that it's worth talking about. I just want to let more people know about them. Um, and so, Andrea, you hadn't heard had you heard of any of these movies before I brought them to your no. attention? Nope, absolutely not. You were you you know, I was like, Well, let's, let's watch something we've all seen before and you're like, No, 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 I found this movie and it's got, you know, this ninety four percent rating, let's watch it. And I'm like, eh, okay. And I didn't have any expectations of what it was gonna be or or, or anything. And wow, I was just blown away by how good it was. Endless was the one we watched first, um, which is actually their latest film. Um, and yeah, I really I really can't. I'm going to gush about hmm. these movies because I love them so much. Well, right. Yeah, I should I should say that they, they were released in the order of resolution, then spring, then the endless. So the exact opposite of the order that we watched them in. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. resolution is a very, very low budget movie. I, I think it was like literally three thousand dollars or something was the budget. You wouldn't you wouldn't you couldn't tell. It's just it doesn't look cheap. It looks well made, to be honest with you. And, hmm. But I know, and you're following these guys on Twitter now. You said I, right? I am, I am. Yeah. They don't tweet too much. <laughs> I would be, I would be interested later to to talk about how it affected your viewing to see them out of order like that. Because yeah. the first, you know, because the third one incorporates so much from the first one. Yep, uh, it's it it is something I want to talk about. Yeah, it, it was a it, d different experience. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, Chris, you watched them in the order that they were released. I did, although I had also not heard of them until you took me off to them, actually. And uh, I also really, really enjoyed all three of them. But no, I had not heard of them either. And I, I watched them in, the, in uh, the order that they were released in. Yeah. And Sarah, so you were saying that you, you came across them on iTunes the same way I did? 
Yeah, like we have Apple TV for most of our shows. In fact, we are occasionally guilty of checking Apple TV first and then <laughs> realizing we could have watched it for free on Netflix. Um, that <laughs> happens all the time. But Apple TV is really good or iTunes, uh, whichever you know hardware you're using with it, um, is actually really good for promoting sort of stuff that you might not have seen. Like you, you get, because that is precisely what happened to me. It was, you know, it, I think they literally have a column or something on it that says, um, you know, recent discoveries. And that's where like your indie films that you haven't heard of, but that, you know, got really good reviews tend to be. And so it's cool that they have that because it works out really well to, uh, you know, find discoveries like that. So yeah, mm -hmm. exactly the same way. And I, of course, watched the <laughs> most recent one first, then I went back and, uh, and watch Resolution um, and then only after talking to Dave a few days ago, did I watch spring. Interesting. So does anyone know anything about Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead? Well, you know, aside from the research I did, um, they've done a lot of interviews, but there's not a lot of that much information about them personally. I was actually really interested to find out if they'd gone to film school. I couldn't find anything that said they had, they met uh, as interns somewhere, but. Aaron Moorhead went to film school. I know. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, so uh, I'll just tell you what my research turned up. Just this is just from listening to interviews with them, and it just gives you a sense of how how hard it is to get started as mm -hmm. indie filmmakers, and how many oftentimes uh, fortuitous coincidences you know have to happen. But so actually, so um, Justin Benson had been working in the film industry for some number of years, and had kind of given up on the idea of ever being able to make a, a real living doing that, and had decided to go back to med school. And he had actually taken the MCATs and everything. Um, but then it was like a year before he would actually be starting classes. And so during that year, he's like, oh, I'll just like apply for a bunch of internships and, you know, see, see if anything happens. And so the last day of one of his internships was the first day of Aaron Moorhead starting at that same, you know, whatever uh, production company or whatever. And so that's how they met. And if it had been, you know, if one of them, if Justin had left a day earlier or Aaron had started a day later, they wouldn't have met there. Um, so that's like, one of the first big lucky breaks and then um yeah and then they just decided at some point to you know they couldn't get funding for any of their uh, ideas so they decided to just fund it themselves out of their checking account like i said for a couple thousand dollars that they scraped together and so they made res a resolution and then entered in the entered it in the tribeca film festival and um there was an intern who reviewed it and was like nope and tossed it in the garbage <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody else involved with this festival just had seen the log line in the, you know, the program or whatever, and, and thought it sounded interesting. And so literally pulled it out of the garbage and watched it. And that's how it ended up in the festival. And then it got um, picked up or, you know, somebody, some studio bought the, bought the rights to it after. It yeah, was... But that, that, that intern is now a studio executive. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. yeah and, and so, yeah, but so then, um, then some studio bought the rights to it. And that was the week that, um, Justin had to decide whether to go back to medical school or not. So if that hadn't happened, he would have gone back to medical school and, you know, they wouldn't have been collaborating on films almost certainly. So yeah, it's just like, you know, just gives Fortuitous. you a sense of how, yeah, yeah. Just how much, how many lucky breaks it, it can take, uh, you know, to make these things happen. Yeah. Um, so that's what my research turned up. I don't know if anyone else did any research or knows anything else that I, that I missed or anything. No, I missed all of that. Clearly, I have to up my Google game. Cause, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm I'm glad he did not go back to med school to yes to, to steal from resolution. That's a better ending, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, so yeah, so I was thinking of starting talking about spring first because resolution and the endless, um, as Chris was mentioning, are kind of tied together. So I I, I want to talk about them together. So let's start off with spring, which is as we've said, is actually the second movie that they did together. Um, but so, uh, so Chris, what were your initial impressions of spring? Just, you know, the first act or so, uh, what did you think of it? Uh, I, I mean, I think like with all of these, uh, all three of them, including spring, what immediately struck me was, um, and I, and this is probably true with any movie that's going to be a low, lower budget film, the, the performances have to be really strong to pull, pull, pull a movie pull off a movie like these where mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's not too much else. Yeah. You know, it's not reliant on special effects or crazy visuals or whatever. And um, I thought that in that movie in particular, 
Well, actually, in all, all three of them, the, the performances were really strong. I mean, you're immediately pulled in by, uh, by the characters. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you just sort of, I don't know, I don't know if empathize is the right word, but, you know, you, you definitely, mm-hmm. that, that opening scene with, with, uh, with, the, with the character with his mother dying in the bed and then, you know, him just dealing with the sort of uh, dirt bags at the bar and, and all, and, you know, just, it, you're just immediately pulled into his character and you want to, you want to know what, you know, where he's heading and what's happening to him and you're sort of in his corner. And so, uh, you know, that, that right from the get go, I was sort of, I was, I was in, you know, I, I was into the movie, you know, from almost the opening scene. Right. So Evan is the the name of the main character. And as right. you said, yeah, in the opening scenes, he gets into a fight at a bar and then the police are, are after him and he has to um, skip town and he decides to just go to Italy because I think his um, his dad had talked about taking him to Italy after college and mm-hmm. it never happened. Um, and, and both of his parents have died. And so he's kind of on his own and adrift and, you know, he lost his job because of this fight and all this kind of stuff. And what you were saying is that, yeah, the, the dialogue in this, I thought was so good. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Particularly just the way it captures the way that men talk to each other and kind of like yes. give each other crap. And, you know, off, especially if you're interacting with the guys who are sort of low class kind of dick head kind of guys, like, um, <laughs> you know, as soon as he arrives in, in Europe, I guess he, he doesn't, does he start out in Italy? Cause Oh no, he's at yeah. a, a hostel, right? And he meets. Yes. The, uh, right. Two British guys, British guys yeah. who are just these like total bloke kind of, yeah. but it, but it is, like like hospital. soccer it's, hooligans. It's, yeah, yeah, they are like soccer uh, hooligans. F- yeah. football hooligans. Yeah, yeah exactly. oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just I I love that the guy is um the the the, the football hooligan guy is telling this this anecdote about um how much he hates this this woman he dated. And he says, you know, you're, you're lucky. Most men don't share their feelings the way I do. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, so I, I thought all that stuff was great. How about Sarah? What did you think of the, uh, yeah, sort of the opening parts of, uh, of spring? Yeah, same. I, I also felt like the, you were, you know, sort of immediately drawn to the characters um, and they were very sort of refreshingly written um, mm-hmm. because the, you know, the main character, Evan, is very much a bro, but a sensitive guy and he's um he's you know in the first maybe five minutes you're kind of like uh you know as if you can kind of tell where this is going and then that doesn't happen and instead it's surprising that he has some emotional intelligence and you know he's uh very much and it 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 kind of become has become sort of a trope in and of itself a little mini trope where you have you know sort of sensitive man who is um you know, sort of thrown into the company of regular bros that he has to put up with all the time. Um, You know, and it it sort of functions as a mirror to show you the difference between your main character and the regular guy, I guess. Um, You know, that's its function. But it it is funny how often that that happens. But I I do think that Spring of the Three Films um, is almost the most mainstream uh, between them because you know the mm-hmm. other two definitely feel like indie films um, and this one feels like an indie film that had some funding behind it and and I, I totally agree with the performances they were really great well yeah. right this this movie it's in sort of a weird genre space because it's it's basically like a Richard a Richard Linklater movie mm-hmm. crossed with yeah. a Lovecraftian horror movie uh, yeah. you could call it before Cthulhu Rise is my uh, mm-hmm. my pitch for it instead of before Cthulhu Rise <laughs> Ah, but I'm bumped. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, so uh, Evan is in Italy, just kind of bumming around, and he meets uh, an Italian woman named Louise. And and the part where the the first um, scene where he sees her, I think, is one of the most gorgeous shots I've ever seen in any. Oh movie. my god! Yes. Um, the music is amazing, and he's just walking through this courtyard in this Italian seaside town, and um, and, and there's just there's there's guys um, playing poker and then there's uh there's a clock tower bell ringing and then mm-hmm. she's sitting there in this very straight you know everything sort of um earth tones and then she's wearing this very vivid blue red, red dress um and then they kind of um their eyes meet and he sort of, and just as he sort of turns and turns around to to watch her um he sort of steps from shade into sunlight and his whole face is just suffused with sunlight it's just everything about mm-hmm. that i love it it's yeah. a technique that it seems like like benson and Moore had do well and and rely on in across these movies i mean because i'm it, it that scene struck me as very 
similar in approach to the scene where the the, the two brothers first show up at the uh, compound um, mm-hmm. when they, they return. And they, yeah, they slow mo it, and so it's like you know a few seconds being captured, spread out over you know like thirty seconds, and you're seeing just so many details all over yeah. the scene: the birds flying yeah. through, and the, you know the people doing what they're doing, and and it's yeah. it's 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 just it is it's really powerful the way that they they do that. It also reminded me of the um, the scene um, in uh, Schindler's List where everything's black and white, and then the only thing that's color is the little girl in the red coat. Yeah. Um, it was kind of like that where you know it it immediately points you to this is important. Look at this, mm-hmm. um, and it's a great uh, visual um, use. It's a great visual thing to do is in as filmmakers. Um, what I've found about these guys is they're incredible just filmmakers and they know about how the language of film works where mm. it's you don't their dialogue is great but they don't there's a lot of parts where they don't use dialogue and you immediately they but they're telling a story with their visuals and then with their shots and with their music and with um you know all of it works together um which is a- amazing thing it's something that as a filmmaker, you maybe don't learn for a while. The fact that they're doing this right off the bat is just, I, I found it astonishing, frankly. Definitely. Yeah. So, so what were your initial impressions, Andrea, of the character of Louise? Mysterious, but also the, the girl who's like, you know, she's approached so many times, everything's kind of like rolls off her back. Oh, this is another guy coming up to me in a bar um, to talk to me. Um so you you think at first it's kind of like she's she's that girl, but she's not. You know, she thinks you think she's going to brush him off completely, um, but then she has this mystery to her as well, um, which he's pursuing as a guy. But then it turns into something else, which, um, you know, you want to follow him. You want to follow her because she's interesting. The first interesting person he's met actually. Mm-hmm. Well, well, but it's interesting because the first conversation they have, she's actually like coming on to him pretty aggressively and he's smart enough to be like, wait, are you like, I think he says this, I have to know if this is the kind of crazy I can deal with or something like that. But it feels like she's playing with him though. Yeah. Uh, I think she, I think, yeah, I took that as she could tell that he was intimidated by her and mm -hmm. she wanted to see if she came on really strong, if she would just scare him off. Um, I don't know. Well, she's like, she's the experienced girl playing with the little boy. Yeah. <laughs> right. Pretty much. Um, well, so how about Sarah? What were your impressions of Louise as uh, as we get to know her? I thought she was a great character. Um, you know, it's it's funny. I, I read a couple of reviews uh, about this film um, from a feminist perspective, and a couple of people were mad because it's sort of a, you know, Sleeping Beauty trope turned on its head um, because uh, of what happens in the end and the idea that, you know, that this sort of man who is okay, wait, wait, wait. incredibly... Let's, let's, <laughs> let's stay away from the ending. Um, okay, okay, okay. All right, uh, well, then I'll just say that she is... Um, I was pleased that it, there were a lot of opportunities to make her into a stereotypical girl, quote-unquote, in the way that men see women, right? Mm. And they didn't do that. And I was very, very pleased every time I sort of expected them to go there, and they didn't. Right. Well, because she's she's very smart and has a, just an amazing, like, whip-sharp yeah. sense of humor. Yeah. Um, and they have really good chemistry. It seemed. Did, did you think that, that the characters had good chemistry in their, when they're sort of, like, Fortin and yeah. Dayton and stuff? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that also goes back to the great acting. Um, the fact that you can get these basically uh, unknown actors and get such amazing performances out of them um, is also a a testament to their good filmmaking. Um, Yeah. I'm I'm wondering like, why haven't I seen any of these actors in anything else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. And and we'll get to that with all the, all the movies Mm -hmm. have you're like amazing actors that I, I certainly, I was not familiar with at all. Um, But so, so, okay. But so we very quickly learn that Louise has a secret that she turns into some sort of weird monster. Um, and I think the first thing uh, we see is that um, they've, uh, she and Evan have slept together. And then the, the next morning she, her skin is doing some weird veiny thing and she stumbles <laughs> out into the cobblestone streets and eats a cat. 
Um, <laughs> so this this is our first real big tip off that this is not a typical Richard Linklater uh, style movie. <laughs> um, but so, Chris, what did you think of the uh, the horror monster element uh, of the movie? I thought it was <clears throat> really well done because every time uh, you, you found out something more about you know her monstrous side uh it it sort of undermined where you thought it had been going from the previous monstrous scene like what you know when, when you first saw that scene where she wakes up and slips out you're thinking oh okay this is just gonna be some sort of werewolf movie and then it's mm -hmm. not at all and then the next one ups the ante and then the next one ups the ante and then she you know, goes you know in a t totally off at a tangent and so i i like that about it that it kept you guessing throughout and and you know um yeah i mean just sort of defied expectations and chris i know you're a big hp lovecraft fan and this i mean all of these things all these these three movies have a strong lovecraft influence i mean the endless actually starts with a uh, an epigraph from lovecraft right but, um this this made me think very strongly of um the shadow over innsmouth were you getting that kind of vibe yeah um it it, it had something of that in it. I mean, it kind of also reminded me of, um, you know, it, I mean, it, in terms of the, the, the creature that she turns into at the end, that's very sort of squid-like in particular, that some of those visuals could have been taken right out of a, a you know, a Lovecraft, uh, Innsmouth type story. Um, I was actually sort of more struck by some of the connections to his other stories that explore uh, characters who are trying to pursue immortality, like the case of Charles Dexter Ward, and in particular, there was one, um, the thing on the doorstep where there's one of the only arguably uh, strong female characters that's a main character and an important plot point in a Lovecraft story, where the, the woman in that case, um, in, the, in that story is sort of, uh, uh, may or may not be possessed by some sort of otherworldly force, but is also possessing other people's bodies in order to kind of achieve a sort of immortality. So so I, I thought those those sorts of Lovecraft stories to me were were an even stronger influence, other than like I said, you know, the Innsmouth type visuals of the sort of squiddy type things. Um, that, that's what struck me as as the strongest Lovecraft connection with Spring. Well, like I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Dagon, which is you know it's mm -hmm. it's an adaptation of the Shadow of Innsmouth, not not an adaptation of the v very low budget. Dagon. <laughs> very low budget and looks it though. Yeah, um, but it, it has sort of similar things where, like, um, there's this beautiful woman, and I think there's a scene where the guy lifts up a sheet or something, and there's squid tentacles underneath. I mean, there's stuff like that, and it, but it, but it's like, yeah, it's it's very sort of like middle of the road sort of horror, low budget horror movie. Whereas this takes some of those same sorts of um, unsettling images and does a lot more um, inventive, um, ambitious um, artistic I, things I with it. Just sort of one la one other little tidbit on that. There's a beautiful instance of foreshadowing where she has a poster on her wall that is um, you see earlier in the movie that it, it must be referencing one of the art exhibits going on there, and it and it features I don't remember who the artist is, but there's a very famous picture of a, a Medusa's head that's been cut off and lying on the ground, and there's sort of like snakes and mm -hmm. you know sort of gore all around it, and it, it it's a Renaissance painting or something. I can't remember who the or maybe later than that, 18, 1800s. But, um, and it, when you then see the scene where he walks in and she's laying on the ground and all squid-like, it, it, it's, she's in the same sort of posture as the head from that poster. And it really mm -hmm. is, is almost like a recreation of that poster with, you know, a, a modern tweak. It's, it's really great, actually. Yeah. They have a lot of great details like that in, in the films, just, mm -hmm. you know, Every, there's a lot of, I hate to use this word, but synergy. <laughs> but. Well, so, so Chris, um, you mentioned um, that sh this, that Louise is pursuing immortality. So let's talk about that. So um, about Andrea, what did you uh, talk, tell us about um, this, this immortality um, project that Louise has? Um, so she is able to metabolize, she gets pregnant and is able to metabolize the cells from the child in order to re be reborn uh, as her child, as her own child. And um, I think that's what it is. Well, sort of and, half, um, half her own child. Half, yeah, half, like, uh, yeah, it's another creature, half her, half um, the child. And uh, it, that's something I'd never encountered before. I, I honestly mm -hmm. didn't think you could surprise me with a new take on that sort of thing. But, um, you know, it's, it's science and mythology combined. Um, and and with a touch of Freudianism. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, which I thought was really uh, new and inventive. And, um, you know, that's the kind of thing I like to see in, you know, either fiction or in movies is something that I haven't seen before, which is, I think, why I was so drawn to all these movies. I haven't seen a lot of this before. Um, right. So just to flesh that out a little bit. So we find out that every 20 years, she has to get pregnant and sort of revitalize her cells in the way you were describing and that she's been doing this for 2000 years um, that we that she was originally, um, you know, uh, in her first life, she lived in Pompeii um, when it was destroyed by Mount Vesuvius um, and has kind of been, you know, living as different under different assumed identities ever since. Um, and I feel I felt like if I have any criticism of this movie, I felt like the section I really liked the ending, the last shot, which again I thought was yeah. beautiful. Um, but the section from the point, and I liked when he sees the the weird her weird squid like form. Um, but I felt like between that, between those two points, for me it mm -hmm. got a little too goofy. Where mm -hmm. um, like like particularly there's a part where they're in a church and there's this older couple. Um, <laughs> yes, and, and the woman says like um, I just saw a vampire doing heroin or something like that. Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, I I agree with you 100% on that. It just got a little too, as you said, goofy and jokey. However, that's a really funny joke. That <laughs> button is absolutely hilarious. So I kind of forgive them on that because they stuck that, you know, great joke in. But I, I do agree. It goes from being serious and creepy to, oh, she's just randomly telling him about how she, you know, did all these things. And, and she's, you know, sticking a needle or an arm in the middle of a church and her eyes falling out of her head. Um, so I wish that they'd kept the tone of ramping up the creepy. Um, but it, it's yeah. also not the same movie that the other ones are. It, it becomes a love story. It, it's a love story too. You know? well, well, no, and I don't like the love story, but I, I just, I felt like it was, you know, I, and I don't really like believe that she's 2000 years old. I mean, she acts like, she, to, my, to my mind, like she's 25 years old. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm granted, I've never met a 2000 year old people, a 2000 year old person, <laughs> But um, just just my my just sort of like reflexive reaction was like I don't believe she's two thousand years old. Yeah. Um, she also so, doesn't her her accent. She doesn't. She has this weird doesn't really have an accent, which um, I also thought was odd for somebody who's been alive. Well, she you know, explains wasn't that in time. the. She, she does. Oh, yes, explains that in the beginning in terms of you know you you sort of develop your own accent after being in uh, multiple places for. Yeah, but I felt like periods of time towards the end, she just kind of has this regular American accent. Like she doesn't talk that much differently than he does. Uh, yeah. And also her, her syntax is American. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, probably an American actress. <laughs> yeah, I, probably. Yeah. That might explain it. Actually, I think she's a German actress, which is weird. Well, she speaks perfect English. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I've been to Germany. They actually all speak perfect English. <laughs> God bless him. <laughs> well, well, Chris, as our uh, his, real history buff, what did you, what do you think about my criticism here that she doesn't seem like she's actually two thousand years old? Well, uh, I don't know if this has anything to do with history per se, but what what uh, you know, I found myself thinking as you were just saying what you said, and and I do on one hand, I think it's a valid criticism, but I wonder if they were playing with some uh, or whether or not they were playing with this. I'm I'm curious. So if you had a person who never actually experienced aging beyond her 30s um, and didn't have the sort of maybe physical crankiness that comes with, you know, the kind of breakdown of your body, would, would you still have a kind of 20-something mindset? Um, you know, if you had never experienced, you know, I don't know, arthritis or aging, yeah. a creaky joints and, and, and actual aging, because, you know, she's basically every time she hits 30, she's back to 18 again or whatever it is, you know, and I wonder how much that affects her sort of outlook on the but, world and her attitude. But that, there, it also, you know, as a person getting older and experiencing stuff, um, I become mentally cranky and she doesn't yeah. seem mentally yeah. cranky. <laughs> no, that's, you know? that's true. You know, I'm, 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 that's definitely true in Andrew's case. I can. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I will. I totally admit to it. Um, but, you know, I've, I'm now planted firmly in the damn kids get off my lawn land. So mm -hmm. I, I, do you have a problem with her not sort of being that way? She's still fresh. She, she looks at the world with fresh eyes. Now, maybe right. that's a function of, you know, her cells regenerating and giving her a new outlook. I don't know. That's me reading into it, though. That's me trying right. to find a reason. Right. And, and I don't know if that was intentional or just a sort of um, flaw in, yeah. in, in it. But, um, you know, I think per, it, what might be lacking is more of the kind of 
uh, deeper wisdom that you would expect from a person mm -hmm. who had 2000 years of experience. Um, and it may be that she has it, but her she certainly expresses it in, in very simplistic ways. It doesn't seem like she's a font of real insight and wisdom. Right. I mean, yeah. he, he, he almost seems to criticize her for that. Well, not criticize, but question like, you mean you've lived 2000 years and you don't have any insight into like what it's all about? You yeah. know, type of thing. And yeah. she's like, eh, not really. Yeah, I feel like there have been a couple of films that have had a character who, you know, sort of was preternaturally old or, you know, young forever, but uh, had been around. So like the yeah. the age of Adeline, same thing. And I, oh, I yeah. that was my biggest criticism of that film is she was impulsive and young mm. acting and you're lacking that sense of gravitas yeah. that comes that the old man had the you know yes. the the um it's the old yes. italian man had that sense of and that wasn't just physical you know and yeah. so in theory mm -hmm. she would be if you really met somebody who was a 2000 year old 20 something woman she would have this unnerving sense of you know just always being bored with everything and and mm -hmm. and always knowing what was going on and i feel like uh, there there have been very few films that have uh, actually explored right. that in the way that they should and they but, you know they mention things like she's a polyglot but then we never mm -hmm. actually see her yeah. use any of that right yeah yeah i actually i always felt that about the uh the twilight movies i'm like these people are all hundreds yeah. of years old and and like they know nothing like why would you uh, nothing made sense about them but yeah you they know that's have, my guilty should, pleasure just just let me get that out should there. have had angelo playing louise i think he's a, such a good actor i think he totally could have nailed that role <laughs> Yeah. The old, the old man. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He was. I looked he him up because he was that familiar. Sense of gravitas to the to the part. I think. Yeah. Yeah, he was um, fantastic. But but also, I mean, as people were saying, she yeah, she's sort of like bubbly and impulsive, and um, you know, like she gets. Uh, she sort of storms off when he won't tell um, her about his mm -hmm. family and stuff with the, mm -hmm. the, that again doesn't seem and also she doesn't seem like the sort of person who possibly could have gone 2000 years without ever having fallen in love with anyone, mm -hmm. which becomes a, an important plot point because we find out that if she ever falls in love with someone, she'll stop being immortal and, yeah. um, you know, it sh yeah, she'll stop being immortal, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, well, I mean, that is sort of like why she hasn't fallen in love. She's deliberately not fallen in love because she doesn't want to give her her immortality. I mean, that's sort of explained, but, you know, the she's... Same thing happens in Age of Adeline. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's right... believable to a point, but, you yeah. know... <laughs> Well, well, right, but I think that this is like one sort of, sort of the awkwardness that comes out of putting this the Richard, Richard Linklater story together with the the immortality story is that like it doesn't quite. I mean, I love this movie, but it doesn't all quite fit together. And like, like if she, um, you know, once once she gets pregnant by him, why? And and then she starts undergoing these uh, uncontrollable metamorphoses that put her at an extreme risk of being, you know captured or killed or like whatever why does she not have a whole like um safe house prepared ahead of time mm -hmm. and just completely yep. um you know cloister herself away from everybody at that point yeah and how does she like how does she transfer her money to the new person i've always wondered that you know like how do you live Bitcoin. especially in the modern age when everybody has an id and and you can be tracked easy um you know yeah, she has a throwaway line where she says what a pain in the ass it is to do all of that but mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of a little hand wavy. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Real, uh, I, forgive, I forgive a lot of the, you know, the little nitpicky problems with this because it's just such a beautiful film. So Right. I mean, I think if you think about it too much, you're you're going to find some holes yep. in it. But, but it casts such a powerful spell over me yeah. that it didn't bother me. There's a lot of movies where I'm wondering these things yeah. as I'm watching it. And yes. that did not happen with this. That It was exactly. only after the fact. You know. Yeah, that's uh, that's always a good uh, measure for measure for a good movie for me is if I don't question anything that happens in it, I just watch it and don't analyze it as I'm watching it because I'm so caught up in the story and the great filmmaking. Um, and that's this movie. That was exactly my experience with this movie was I was so caught up in it that I didn't question anything. Yeah. Um, well, well, let's come back to the thing, the point Sarah raised earlier about the sleeping, how this falls into the sleeping beauty trope. You want to tell us about that? Uh, well, you know, in the, in the end, she... Uh she basically believes that she is going to transform again. She's going to take on a new form that will not only be totally alien uh, to her current form, but also be some sort of mismatch or uh, mix match of, 
his DNA, um, me meaning that it would be literally just really impossible for them to continue uh, a romantic relationship after transformation. Um, you know, they, they've played with this in Star Trek The Next Generation, you know, where you have people going to, to different host bodies and the people who are in love with them saying, oh, I can adapt, I can adapt, and then it gets to be too much for them. Um, so that part was totally believable in that they wouldn't be able to, you know, or they would have to separate. But he decides that he desperately wants to spend like her last 24 hours together and she's kind of like what's the point you know i mean it's there's just we're not going to get any more out of this um and uh he decides that he wants to stay with her anyway and basically convinces her um to do this and you know because of that last day that they spend together um and the the fact that he genuinely doesn't care um, what she is and still loves her. I think that is the part where they're, they're saying that she hadn't experienced that. And so because of all of that, she ends up falling in love with him. And because she falls in love with him, the curse is broken. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, you, you, it's, it's funny. Like I, I read the, the criticism and I agreed with it intellectually on a certain level, but I also, I forgive it because they did new things with that trope. You know, and I think that is often something that critics, uh, you know, forget sometimes is that just because a trope exists doesn't mean it can't be done well. And I feel like they did it really well. It was very mm -hmm. cool to see this sort of gender bent idea of the sleeping beauty thing. And, you know, even though, yes, she, uh, you know, there's nothing special about this guy ostensibly that mm -hmm. would mean that she would, this 2000 year old woman who is wealthy and brilliant would actually fall in love with this, you know, peon. And that's, <laughs> that was kind of the point of the feminist criticism is this is this ultimate male fantasy, right? Where you are, you fall in love with a woman who's well above you and mm -hmm. then manage to convince her to fall in love with you. And in, in the process, you fix this broken monster. You know? mm -hmm. And so I totally agree with that. And I, I understand. But at the same time, because the film is so well done, I absolutely forgive them for doing it. And I honestly think that, you know, what they did is they turned the trope on its head. Because the reason why he's different is because he's, you know, genuinely emotionally invested. He genuinely cares for her and takes care of her. Um, and that, you know, I think that when the, in earlier in the film, she even says to him, you know, I think you have uh, more faith in men than I do. <laughs> or she has seen 2000 years of, of dealing with men. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it took her by surprise. I also think it, it relates back to the beginning of the movie where he's taking care of his mother. He's, he's a yeah. caretaker um, and you love him for that. And yeah. he wants to take care of her. And he, he, I get the feminist issues with it. And, you know, the woman giving up her power for love um, trope, uh, which, yeah, as a as a feminist, I, I have a problem with. But again, yeah, I forgive a lot for this yeah. movie. You know, it's interesting because uh, to me, that's one of the most difficult uh, aspects of the movie for me to kind of come to grips with was his uh, so-called love for her, because I do think he was in love with her. Um, and I do think she ultimately was in love with him, but it's kind of weird that, you know, someone that he was in love with, he basically is trying to very obviously convince her to mm -hmm. give up immortality for him. I mean, you would yeah. think that if he really was in love with her, he would be like, I should just leave her right now, you know, make her hate me, act like a jerk and leave so she could live on beyond this. Right? You know what I mean? Um, it, it, I, I, but then as I was struggling with that, I, I realized two things. I think, number one, it was that, you know, on some level, he may have recognized that even though she wasn't admitting it, that even before that last 24 hours, she actually had already fallen in love with him. And, and the message that he sort of leaves the, you know, leaves us with at the end of the movie, which, which is the strongest way that it ties in with the other two movies, by the way, is this idea that, um, you know, what's the point of immortality, whether it's in the form of this woman or in the never ending loops in the cult compound, if it's just, you know, sort of running on a, on a treadmill as opposed to having a much shorter span of life that actually has more meaning and fulfillment, whether that is in the form of love or it's in the form of, uh, you know, feeling some sort of self-actualization in some other way, like the brother does at the end. I, I, I you know, that, that sort of un, 
unraveled it a little bit for me at the end and, and made it not so like, oh God, he's kind of gross. Why would he do that to her? And then it was just like, well, maybe he felt like, I don't know. I don't, do, are you getting what I'm saying? What yeah, I'm saying? I was, was going to say that exact same thing, Chris. And I, okay. I, I think it, it should have, there should, like, I, I like what you're saying, but I think some of that needed to be foregrounded in the text more than it was that he yeah. is concerned about her not, you know, he, he is like grappling with if she, if we're, if we're together, she's going to die. Yeah, I mean, he basically comes right out, you know, and says to her, like, so how would you do this if you wanted to, to, you know, it's like, gosh, you're pushing her toward giving up her immortality when they're in the church, you know, he says that to her. And I'm just like, really? I don't know. And then... And I feel like they didn't do enough to explain how she actually felt about her condition. After 2000 years of living like this, does she like it or not? You know, and you're kind mm-hmm. of like watching toward the end, trying to figure out whether she even wants to continue like this or not, mm-hmm. whether it's this burden or whether it's this, you know, f- awesome fantasy or a little bit of both. Right. So. Well, I think a lot of that is because they could have addressed it after uh, in that jokey part. And I think they went for this, you know, that goofy part and that they lost an opportunity there to ex- explain her and her motivations mm-hmm. and what she's looking for. Yes, that would have been the time to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 All right. I think there's a lot more we could say about Spring, but we got to, I think we got to move on to these other movies. Um, so as I said, we, the other two movies we're going to talk about are Resolution and The Endless. And, um, and, and they're very, you know, pretty closely linked together um, by some significant characters. Uh, and so in, in Resolution, um, there's this guy named Mike, and he used to be best friends with this guy, Chris, from high school. Um, but Chris has become a, a junkie and is just often living in this sort of rundown shack in the woods, um, just doing drugs. And, and Mike is going to make one last attempt to get uh, Chris clean by uh, zapping him with a stun gun and, and uh, handcuffing him to a pipe and just <laughs> forcing him to you know not do drugs for a week. Um, and so, Chris, so you, you, I think you're the only one of us that watched this before any of the other movies, right? So, I think um, so. Yeah. So, what were your impressions um, going into Resolution? Like, what did you know? What was when? Well, sort of, how did you figure out what was going on, and so on? Well, let me, let me first of all just say that with all three of these movies, I made a point. You know, you you suggest you recommended that I, I watch these, and I did. But I went into all of them not even having read the little two sentence blurb about what they were about. So I had no idea other than that they were some sort of a supernatural sci-fi horror type thing. That's all I knew. So, and, and that's the best way to watch them. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it worked for me. I mean, I, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, so I, I, it it definitely, like, so I had no idea where anything was going. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat what your question was, Dave? Mm-hmm. Now I sort of got off topic. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll just talk about, yeah, just what did you think of the early stages of the movie and when did you right, start right. realizing what where it was going? Uh, well, I mean, again, I think um, immediately I was drawn in less so by the the character. What is it, Mike? Mike, yeah, Mike, um, who is sort of like the, the the straight man for the for the other character, Chris, who mm-hmm. who kind of steals the show. But yeah. <laughs> um, but he, uh, you know, I'm immediately drawn into their relationship, and in particular because you know Chris is obviously in a really dark place, and um, Mike is obviously you know putting it putting it all out there to try and do anything he can for his friend, and so you you empathize with. Mike for for doing that for his friend and you are sort of rooting for both of them to try to help Chris out of this awful situation and then when you know the sort of weird things start start happening you're just like oh gosh on top of all this they're now dealing with what the heck is all this you know um and so it just becomes more and more compelling it's just like the ante yeah. again just keeps getting raised and raised yeah. and raised yep. and uh you just go yeah. deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole and it's just great i mean they're- they're so good at ratcheting up the tension. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, especially I just watched uh, Resolution this morning and it's just like one thing on top of another on top of another. It's it's a million different layers of tension from everywhere. You know, the drug dealers, the mm-hmm. um, the uh, Native Americans, uh, all the crazy tapes they're finding. Um, it's just like every around every corner. I'm just you're just waiting for something yeah. to happen. It's just, just the like, girl staring in the window. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, that was so terrifying. It really was. 
<laughs> well, right. I, I guess I should have said, so the reason that Mike finds Chris in the first place is because it seems that Chris has sent him a, a videotape, sort of a weird videotape of him just sort of like being wasted in the woods, shooting a gun and stuff. Um, but then we, we find out that Chris never sent him this tape. Um, and so he, he sort of gets the idea that there's some sort of entity or some sort of force in these woods that is able to communicate by creating, you know, putting messages on, um, you know, audio visual media. Um, and, uh, so yeah, so that gets sort of more and more, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the main supernatural aspect of the movie. Um, can I, can I take a quick, quick second to just say how incredibly great that opening is? There's very little dialogue but you immediately understand what's going on. You know, the quick cuts in the, you know, the video of the guy shooting and, and smoking crack. Um, and then you, you pull back and you see Mike watching it and then a map. And then the next thing is he is in bed with his wife and she's just say, all she says is it's a terrible idea. And then she kisses him on the head and says, be safe. And it's like immediately, you know, an entire story in those few seconds, in a few minutes. Um, and that, that right there is like it takes people so long to learn how film uh, language works. And these guys just did it right off the bat. That was their first movie. Mm. Um, and I was just blown away by that. I, you know, I went to film school and I have seen a lot of student films and a lot of indie films. 99.999% of them are awful because mm -hmm. nobody can get that. Yeah. Uh, these guys, I mean, you know, Justin wrote the script and then they both directed it. And that's that's the thing that I keep coming back to and I find completely astonishing is that they're like natural storytellers. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I was I was blown away by that. Actually, let me just say, Andrea, so from listening to interviews with them, one thing I thought was interesting is that they asked um, Aaron Moorhead kind of what movies really made you want to be a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you know, what? I mean, I liked watching movies. He's like, I like Jurassic Park. That was a big favorite movie yeah. of mine. But he's like, I, I got into it more because I liked making movies. I like just fooling around with my camera and like making little movies. And that he's been doing that since early childhood. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, by this point, like he has a lot of, you know, low yeah. budget movie production experience well, under his belt. I was also thinking, um, you know, Tarantino, he worked in a video store and he just sat there and watched movies and watched movies and watched movies, um, which is, uh, and let me say this, and I'm sure NYU will come after me now. <laughs> um, if you want to be a filmmaker, don't go to film school. Just don't. It's useless. You're wasting your parents tens of thousands of dollars. All you need to do to figure out how to make a great film is watch movies, watch a ton of movies, read the scripts, any you can download a million scripts off the internet, read the movie, watch the movies, read the scripts, take it apart, deconstruct it, figure out how it works, put it back together like, a, you know, an El Camino on your front lawn. That's how you figure out how to be a filmmaker. That is the way to do it. Don't waste your parents' money. Don't go to film school. It, it'll ruin you. <laughs> there. I think that's true about a lot of creative disciplines. I've met yes. people who hated going to Peabody. They hated music after Peabody. I went to art school. I hated art for a number of years after mm -hmm. I was done. So yeah. <laughs> it's an yeah. unfortunate yeah. state of affairs. Yeah. But I, 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 can't imagine, I can't remember how much my mother paid for film school, but I learned... I'm sorry, NYU. I learned nothing there. Uh, everything I know about making good movies or writing, I learned from watching movies, from reading scripts. End of story. But I, I thought what was striking about what he said was, I mean, I think a lot of people would get the idea like, oh, I want to make movies. I got to watch a lot of movies. But what he was saying, like, you know, even the watching movies was less important than the actual like making your own movies. Yeah. You yeah. Know, that that's well, really... for, for filmmakers, um, for directors, for me as a writer, watching them and figuring out how they worked you know right right uh well so uh sarah let's get you back in here what did you think just overall of sort of the you know up to say the halfway point or something of uh, resolution i feel like just watching all three of these movies one thing that uh struck me about their style is that first of all i really appreciate that they are putting a lot of emotionally intelligent male characters in their films that they mm -hmm. are you know, we, we see a lot of stereotypical male behavior in film. Mm -hmm. And it's really lovely uh, to see a film about, you know, a man taking care of his friend who, incidentally, a lot of us would walk out on that guy. Mm -hmm. I don't care what their childhood was like together. Like, like that guy was a serious pain in the ass, which is, is, is what is, is like when, you know, somebody's coming down from drugs like that. But, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, regardless of, of who they actually are. But I think that uh, another thing that, that is lovely about these films is that, you know, I avoid a lot of, a lot of films that are marked uh, as horror genre films because I, I, I don't like a lot of what's in the genre. And what ends up happening, I think, is that there's a lot of films that really don't, be, don't be deserve those labels. Mm -hmm. um, but I really love the fact that the, they're putting good characters in bad situations. Whereas a lot of horror seems to be about putting people of questionable morality, you know, people mm -hmm. that you openly dislike, people who are stupid, and therefore the whole thing is it's supposed to be funny to watch them get their comeuppance, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you, you get really graded uh, for watching that over and over again, and I th which is, I think, part of why I, I tend to avoid the genre on, on the whole. But, you know, what makes his films different is that he's putting really good people in some really unfortunate situations, which is all the more horrific and frankly, much more effective because you're, you know, the, these are, these things are happening to normal, good, lovely people. And, you know, this, this guy ended up in a horrific experience, having a horrific experience because he's trying to help his friend, mm -hmm. you know, and that's uh, much more, there's something much more true to life to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, I agree with that 100%. I just want to say that. <laughs> well, when, you, that. when you're saying I would have walked out, like the point at which I 100% would have walked out is when the like neighborhood junkies shoot the dog on their front porch. <laughs> yeah. And then he's yeah. You knew that dog was going to die. You bring a dog in, in the beginning of a movie, you know that dog's going. <laughs> Come on. But just the fact that he chose to stay after that point, you're like, this guy is hardcore or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, that was, I have been wondering, like, those guys are coming back, dude. Don't sleep. I would never sleep. Right. Yeah. Well, why? I mean, they had a whole like arsenal of guns under the house. Mm -hmm. Why did they not get at least yeah. bring one of at least one of them up into the house, or at least yeah. just not leave them there with the wide open basement yeah. door <laughs> for anyone to take? Yeah, I yeah. was wondering that too. <laughs> um, yeah. but even having watched, were you confused at all by this movie, Chris? Because even having watched The Endless before this, I still was like, it, when it got to the end. Uh, I was like, wait, I, I, I need to, like, read up on the internet to have people explain to me what was going on in that movie. Well, um, no, uh, I, I think actually, I, I, don't, I mean, I, it's kind of hard to put myself in, in the shoes of, of you guys having watched the third one first, but I almost feel like it, 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 because it was, I didn't have all the other baggage that would have come from seeing the third one first, it, it to me felt very, um, very sort of linear and, 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 uh, uh, that it resolved. It, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, uh, okay. That being said, I, I, I understood as I was kind of spoon fed the information by the characters as they're learning it, um, that like, you know, and, and, and arguably I think the, 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 the character, Mike, he seemed to figure things out on some level a lot more quickly than I did, but I get, you know, I can forgive that because it had, you know, it's a movie and, and we know it's a movie, but, but, you know, he immediately starts to think like, I think there's some, someone or something trying to communicate with us through media. And it's like, Oh, okay. Um, and then as long as you as, are, you know, get on board with that idea, then, and you see everything else that's happening as the movie goes on as other iterations of that, um, then it's just a question of, well, is this thing, trying to scare them is it trying to mm -hmm. help them is it trying to warn them is it trying to uh you know do you know does it have some other ulterior motive that has nothing to do with them and they're just in the middle of it um so to me the mystery was trying to figure out what this entity wanted and what why it was putting them through all of this uh what was the message it was trying to send and then at the end of the movie i mean you guys had had the ending to some extent spoiled because you at least knew mm -hmm. that you, yeah. you knew that they were still around and caught in a loop. Uh, yeah. You know, I, when the movie ended and that final scene cuts and they said, can, can we try it a different way? Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, which is a great ending. I was just like, oh, man, you know, because it's like you don't know what the heck's going to happen. You don't know if that thing's about to basically literally chew them up and swallow them or if they are going to somehow get a reset button or, you know, some other, you know, you, you don't know what's happening, but, you know, it's not good at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, and I thought that was a great, great, I, I loved the ending of, of Resolution. And I think it would have lost a lot of its power for me if I knew, I had seen them already in the third movie. But uh, so that, so now I'm curious, like, so how did that affect, like, in other words, was, the, was 
Did did you did feel it that it. did it ruin the tension of the movie knowing where they end up? Not for me. Um, I mean, I wish I had seen Resolution first, but I thought the ending of Resolution was the best ending. I I thought it was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, and also, I agree. Um, that before you know the the house is on fire and the, the two of them are laughing. And they're like, we had a happy ending, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> right. the monster appears, and it's like, oh yeah, no. Um, which I thought was a great way to end it. Um, yeah, I didn't have any problem following it. I, I wish I had seen Resolution first, but it didn't bother me. Um, it, didn't, it didn't. Because I was so invested in these guys. Okay, okay. Cool. Well, I guess part of the reason I was a little confused is because, so they go to this guy, Byron or something, that he had been with the, the old man researchers. In yeah. The, in the, um, trail, uh, trail oh, home. that scene was amazing. But I, I, I found him actually so weird and creepy that i had trouble actually paying attention to what he was saying so i didn't <laughs> like it didn't really sink in what when he was talking about it wants an ending or he he explained yeah. something to that effect yeah it's funny because I, I was actually um talking to my girl my girlfriend and i were watching t this together and i said like I, I sort of stopped it at this point i was like this is what every this is why i don't really talk to strangers anymore because i feel like every <laughs> conversation i have with somebody on the train or something if someone starts talking to me it's like normal for like 20 or 30 minutes <laughs> And then it just takes this like weird turn into like, oh my god, who like what is going on now? <laughs> That's and... the New Yorker's reaction. <laughs> I think people outside of New York have that same reaction. Yeah, so I, th I think like I was so distracted by that thought, I didn't quite pick up everything he was saying. But um, I don't know, Sarah, what did you did you think this movie was confusing at all? I think I I also wished that I had uh, seen it first before I saw Endless because uh, or the Endless because I feel like the the link between the loops. And the monster or entity's desire for a story mm -hmm. is still very confusing to me. And so I think I made like a mental note of, okay, well, I've got to read more online about what people have said about this. Um, but, you know, in terms of just being confused about, uh, it was kind of like, okay, so was the loop thing part of the plot when they made the first one mm -hmm. or did it evolve into that when they made uh, The Endless? Right. Yeah. I wondered that, too. Yeah. And I don't know. Yeah, I, I kind of found myself after the dog died thinking, is the dog going to come back? Because everybody yeah. comes back. Right. Um, yeah. I, but... I, it, it may well be that if they've spoken about this online or, or the answer is out there. But my, my take on it was I thought that they – tried to kind of retrofit the loop thing into it and that the loop thing was not part of it. Well, then again, it was foreshadowed with the Frenchman with the mirrors. Yeah. So maybe they had some inkling of it. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they, they were, yeah, maybe they were thinking about it. I, I'll take that back. But I mean, it didn't need to be there for the first movie to work. Um, the, the loop, you, no. you don't really know anything about the loop thing until the third movie. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and yet the resolution movie still works on its own. Um, Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll just say, Chris, from from interviews I listened to with them, they said that they had no plans to make another movie, you know, a, after Resolution, because they're like, you know, like we had three thousand dollars. Like, we're not thinking like of making a whole like series of movies, you know, like we were just like we didn't think we were ever going to get another job after this movie, you know, <laughs> not just in film, but just in general in life. Um, but um, yeah, so I don't know how much of the mythology just existed in notes or whatever, but um they definitely, you know, like I, I they, they, my understanding is that they went back later and looked at resolution and said like, oh, I feel like there's stuff here we haven't, you know, that could be expanded. How can we expand it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um that, that most of it was not like planned out from the start. But I don't feel like I've lost anything not having an answer to every question. Um I, I, I think that's actually a good part of the storytelling is that there are questions left unanswered and yeah. that's, so, you know, it's mysterious, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I didn't feel any, any loss there. But they did do such a great job of seamlessly blending the two movies yeah. together because I mean, there are a lot of weird kind of loose ends in the first movie and they tied them all up in a way that like, you know, I don't know, I'm just thinking of a thing like lost where it's all about <laughs> loose ends and none of them get tied up. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, but like, you know, you have the scene where he's he, jogging along the path and the three, you know, cultists come out and talk to him, and yes. they ne they never appear again in the in the first movie. Yeah, and you it's know, the so... two of them too. It's it, we're talking about resolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's Justin and and Aaron there. Right, right. Um, and I'm wondering if it's the, if they're supposed to be the same characters. You know, they were kids in the cult, and then 
they yeah, leave. They're, they're, they're definitely the same characters because you actually see that footage again in mm. the endless. Oh yes, that's right. When they play that thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I I agree. To me, the best horror and weird supernatural movies, in a way, are kind of the ones where the you never get the answers because the answers are always far less interesting than yeah what your imagination might be trying to come up with, you know, like but yeah. and failing to. Um, but, you know, if I were to try to come up with some sort of explanation, you know, it, to me, it seemed like maybe this, whatever this entity was, whether it was something from outer space or whether it was something from the land and some sort of mythological being, um, that it, it, it had sort of isolated these little separate areas within this wider area as almost like separate little movie studios where it was putting different people through little scenes over and over again to sort of study and learn from human nature and see how people react and different, you know, yeah. to different things. But I mean, in a way it's like, yeah, that kind of makes, that fits with the movie, but I, I kind of almost hope that's not the answer because to me that's boring, man. It's like, yeah. I, I like it better not knowing what the hell yes. is going on. I know? agree with that. I agree with that. Well, right. And I think that this is like, these are the kind of movies where you have to go into it knowing that you're not going to understand everything right. the first time you yeah. watch it and maybe not even multiple yeah. watches and and so on. And if you don't like that kind of movie, these these are probably not the movies for you. I want to also right. just say about um, Spring is also like I, I didn't pick up, pick up on this really, but Spring is also set in the same universe as the other two movies. And the the Chris guy, the the, the junkie friend from um, – you know, from these other from the endless and resolution is the bartender yeah uh, at oh. the beginning of of spring yeah but he also... but he has a different name are you sure it's actually supposed to be the same character he's oh, not called chris he's called like um well yeah, I he has a different name i know because he mentions shitty carl is shitty carl's the um guy who's supposed to cover for evan um and shitty carl's the character from the endless so i think they are supposed to tie together that's oh, weird right. i didn't i didn't notice that he has a different i don't know if there's an explanation for that it, I'm, it, i think it's just like you know you, they're cute little easter eggs right you know right. that if you if you catch them great if you don't it doesn't really affect anything there's also i don't know if you noticed in spring there's a part where she turns the tv on and you see justin and aaron on the tv for just a split second yeah no in, in where is this in the movie Spring, when they're at Louise's apartment, I think she turns on the TV, and you just see like she there's like a show with both of them in it, and then she flips to like um, the ruins of Pompeii, I think I think or some archaeological. Oh wow, no, I didn't pick up on that. Um, I also want to say that, um, you know, speaking of horror, where you know, Sarah, you said you you don't horror is not your thing, and and you wouldn't necessarily go to anything that, that's horror. Um, I'm, I feel the same way. I yeah. don't. What I think of horror, I think of you know, like Friday the Thirteenth, and that is absolutely not my jam as far yeah. as movies go. Um, so when when you know this is called horror, I'm a little like, really, this is that doesn't feel like horror to me. It's really more like psychological, um, psychological horror. Yeah. Um, and I thought they what they do really well is that they ratchet up the tension without ever showing you anything. You know, the way the Jaws. Um, the the mm. you know the the shark was broken so they can they for the first half of the movie you never see the shark specifically because they didn't have the money to fix the shark yeah um, <laughs> but it, they they ended up making a great movie because you know horror is really in the mind and what we come up with in our heads is going to be so much more terrifying than showing you know, some monster on the screen or a giant shark right from the beginning. Yeah. We're building it up in our heads to the point where it is finally the monster. And they do that exactly. They do that really, really well. And it all, that's also a function of the fact that they were working with a teeny tiny budget. Um, and I think they said this in one of their interviews where, you know, when you're working with lim within limitations, it, it makes you be more creative because you have mm -hmm. to come up with inventive ways to show something that you know you you can't show yeah. um also the other movie that does this really well is um uh Blair Witch Project you never see anything at mm -hmm. all and and the horror is all in your head and you build it up and you build it up to the point where you know some of those scenes nothing really happens but I was watching them you know from behind my hand because I was waiting for something and you never see the monster the monster's in your head um which is a really good filmmaking technique 
I'll, I'll say, though, I mean, like, in interviews, Aaron Moorhead said that it drives him crazy when people say, I don't like horror, because he's like, do you like Jaws? Do you like Jurassic Park? He's like, everybody likes those movies. You know, those are monster movies. You know, those yeah. are horror movies. Uh, um, yeah, I know. But I, in my head, it doesn't. it's not a horror movie. Like I said, I associate horror with people getting chopped up and and i've said this to you that that i i hate those movies i yeah. don't want to see somebody right. being chased down a hallway by a maniac with a, a chainsaw i don't want to see that i don't understand the the attraction in seeing people cut to pieces i really don't what i want what i like is psychological or ghost stories like that is you know that's yeah where i find terror you know and that goes back to the the Lovecraft quote at the beginning, which is fear. It's fear of the unknown. Um, so that if you never know what's going, it, what's what the monster is, it just, it's makes you more fearful. It's I'm just going to say frightening. like Jurassic Park's a really scary movie. And you see a lot of dinosaurs in that movie. <laughs> well. See, I don't find Jurassic Park scary. I find it, a, <laughs> you know, it's an adventure movie. To well, me. And, and there's a, there's a big difference between man versus nature and man versus mm -hmm. man horror, really. And mm -hmm. and I mean, if there's any if there's any genre that actually really needs to be broken into smaller genres, it's the horror genre. Every yeah. other genre is super specific when you think about it. You know, every time you see a romantic comedy, you know exactly where you're going to get. There might be some surprises, but yeah. you pretty much know what you're going to get. And even with with something like like drama, even though that can encompass a great deal. But only horror is the is is there this and I and you know maybe help me if I if I'm forgetting something but you they have a wide variety of yeah. different kinds of you literally have no idea what you're going to get and that has unfortunately caused me to miss out on some movies that I probably would enjoy the hell out of uh, because I'm I'm so worried about seeing something that's going to stay with me forever <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I agree, I agree with that. I'm sensitive. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> all, right, all right. So let's let's get into the endless uh, before we run out of time. So so Sarah. Um, okay. Let me say that the endless. Like we've sort of uh, gotten into a little bit. I think you have these um, Justin and Aaron characters who were in this some sort of cult and in this same area as the um, the as resolution took place. And as and when they were about fifteen and twenty, they're brothers. And when they were about fifteen and twenty, um, the older brother convinced the younger brother that they had to get out because he thought everyone was about to do a you know mass suicide and now it's 10 years later and they get a video from the cult showing that everyone's still alive and um but now maybe they are actually going to kill themselves it's not clear and so the younger brother says like this is really the only family we ever had i want to go back and say goodbye to everyone and also he is not at all happy with the way that their lives have gone since they left the cult and has fond memories of, of when they were in the cult. So so the older brother agrees, okay, we'll go back, we'll just like spend the day, say goodbye to everyone, and then we're we're gone forever. Um and so Sarah, what did you think of this this cult um in um uh, in the endless? I feel like you asked me because you know that I like went to vacation Bible school and stuff when I was growing up. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that it's like I feel like I, I it's funny, like I don't I I was watching that thinking, yep, nope, this is terrifying. And I'm like, I always wonder whether it's more terrifying for me or for anyone else who was raised in a like a restrictive thought environment. And that's really mm -hmm. like what, you know, it, there's a very thin line between, you know, vacation Bible school, which is like this super happy, friendly, innocent <laughs> thing and cults where people just decide to kill themselves. There's a very thin line between these things. And I, I you know, so I, I love the, the, the movies that sort of explore the you know, the horror of, of groups of people that get together mm -hmm. and form these, you know, kind of terrifying ideas. But uh, yeah, the, the culty, culty thing was totally believable to me. Mm -hmm. I, I, I loved it. It was great. Well, but, and it seems nice, right? Like initially, well, I mean, there's, I guess there's like, there's some weird stuff right from the start, but, but overwhelmingly your impression is that these people seem kind of like harmless and, you know, pleasant. They're sort of hippies out in the woods playing guitar and. Well, know, that's and the beauty this... of it. You know, and they've explored this so many times in science fiction where the closer you get to utopia, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the more you are in danger of creating dystopia because you're, you're, you want this perfect em environment in order to have that, you have to, it comes with some costs. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I, I love that. It's great. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it cuts out individualism. It sacrifices yeah. individualism for utopia, but you know, humans are humans and they're going to be humans and yeah. it, it will always fall apart. 
Right. And I guess like now it's hard to talk about the endless because we, we've covered some of this ground already. But so, so Chris, going back to the Lovecraft thing, there's a very strong Lovecraftian element in this as well. You want to talk about that? Well, I mean, I suppose that the, the, there are some, you know, overt references to, you know, be, describing this, this entity as something that we can't quite see because they, they talk about how that it's, it's sort of colors that are off of our spectrum. And so, of course, those are all references to the color out of space, which is a short story by, by Lovecraft. Um, Do you want to just, sorry, just for people who haven't read the story, just explain what that is. I mean, in, in a nutshell, it's basically about this sort of meteor that crashes in a farm district. Uh, and, you know, uh, it, it basically it starts turning all the people around in that area. It's driving them mad, turning the livestock into weird monstrosities and making all the vegetation grow like really big and, and, and overgrown, but also sort of just like rotten and disgusting. I, I think a lot of it was... Um, a lot of the themes were kind of used in um, what was the, the Jeff Vandermeer movie that just came out last mm, year. Annihilation. Annihilation, yeah. I mean, I think he's he's explicitly playing with a lot of the stuff from The Color Out of Space in that movie uh, in, and in his book that the movie was based on. Um, but uh, so, you know, I think there's there's definitely a lot of our references to that. Let me just say, Chris, and in the story, the reason it's called The Color Out of Space is because the this alien presence is a color that no, no one's one ever seen describe. before it's like yeah. this weird inexplicable alien color that you can't compare to anything yeah when, whenever any eyewitnesses are asked to describe it by the people who come in to investigate afterwards it's only by analogy that they can describe the color because it's not a color that really exists um but yeah so i mean but but some of the the more lovecraftian moments to me in the analyst that stick out of my mind is this moment where they're going to have a tug of war with this with the sky basically there's like something out in the darkness up in the mm -hmm. sky mm -hmm. and this, so you see this rope stretching up toward the moon i, I will never forget that oh it's as long as i live so good. that was really great yeah. yeah yeah i would agree um and then there's this scene where um um justin dives down into the bottom of the lake to retrieve yeah. a um like a um box, box or something mm -hmm. and and then you see this overhead shot where there's some just weird inky in presence water. It's gigantic um, yeah. under the water. Like stuff like that just seems so Lovecraftian to me. Yeah, 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 definitely. I, I loved, I was reading that um, for all those aerial shots, they use drones. Because I was watching them, oh, I'm wow. like, how did, did they get a helicopter? Did they have a giant jib? Like, what What the hell was that? But yeah, it's drones. And, and they got amazing footage. Just really, really effective. Makes them, you know, it's a low budget uh, way to make a great movie. Mm-hmm. And I guess, I don't know if we said this explicitly, but the color out of space, um, Hal, who is the sort of spokesman of the cult, he, he's the one who says explicitly, he, he, he starts talking about the, a color that you can't mm -hmm. describe. Yeah, yeah, or something. yeah. And, and this idea that he's, you know, trying to, you know, use some sort of physics equation to explain this unknown and unknowable thing that, that, that's been used a lot in, in Lovecraft and, um, and, and just sort of throughout these movies, the, the fact that you have these, you know, people, these archaeologists and researchers and and film students and everyone from all different angles, you know, and approaches trying to delve into these deeper, darker secrets. Uh, you know, that that's, again, something that's used over and over and over again in Lovecraft. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Andrew, are there any other scenes from The Endless that kind of stick out in your mind that you really liked? Um, well, the, the revisiting Mike and um, and Chris is heartbreaking. I mean you know they're they're trying everything to get out of there uh, and also the um the part where he stumbles upon the um the tent you know where the with the yeah with the three oh, that God, very yes. short loop oh it's, god I mean, yeah it's just like that was such a what the fuck moment and there you know there's really yeah. not a lot of explanation for it no. um but it, oh yeah. oh oh and the guy who hangs himself right that was also one of those sets you back in your chair kind of things. Um, yeah, thank you for those. Both of those things are going to be with me for yes. the rest of my life. Every <laughs> yeah. time I can't sleep in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So what happens is that um, Justin and Aaron come to discover that basically this whole area is um, covered with these time space bubbles, these sort of invisible time space bubbles. And I think the rules are basically that if you die within one of them um, before the loop resets, 
then you can physically never step out of them again. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this, this cult is within this, this very long lasting one that goes for 10 years before it resets. And then at the end, the, the monster in the sky kills everyone in sort of this ritualistic fashion. And then they all, everyone gets resurrected and they start over, um, 10 years younger. Um, and then some of the other ones are very, you know, are yeah, three seconds long or three yeah. hours long, uh, and so on. By the way, hearkening back to the tug of war with the moon, I loved how in the scene when they're all going to basically be taken up, the rope drops out of the sky into the middle of them. Yeah. I mean, that was just such a perfect touch. I mean, mm -hmm. and then they're gone. You know, it's like yeah. they've been yanked up into the sky, basically. And they, and they also set up a possible explanation with the, the guy who doesn't speak running out there. Um, and then at the end, he comes back or he shows up behind them, I think. Yeah. And then you're like, OK. <laughs> right. Well, but like, but then there's stuff like the the magic trick where he the guy throws the baseball up in the air and then oh, it doesn't yeah. come down for several minutes. That where you're like, yeah. you, you know, it's it's it, there, there's very clear seems to me supernatural stuff going on. Yeah. Um, the, the, I think clear. that was that was the first real supernatural thing that happens, and then right after that is the rope thing. So it, it just like goes really quickly from oh that's weird, and then oh <laughs> we're really weird now. <laughs> Um, how about Sarah? Do you have any other things in, in, about this movie that you really liked? I feel like I'm invested at this point where I actually, you know, God forbid, would want to see a third one where some of this stuff and some of these stories get resolved. I feel really bad for the girlfriend who's yeah. like looking for, you know, she's uh, pregnant and, you know, in the um, resolution, right? Like they're yeah. going to have a baby. And yeah. then he goes off to, you know, help his loser friend and she never sees him again. And then she ends up like coming to this area and staying in a cabin and is just completely fucked up because she has no idea what happened to him. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's essentially it's, it's funny. Like, I, I really feel like, again, this is another thing that makes them so interesting in this genre is that. You know, there's sort of the horror of empathy, you know, of mm -hmm. you're, you're feeling you're I'm going to feel bad about that woman for the rest of my life. Because, yeah. You know, what I mean? it's like I, those little tidbits of experiencing other people's pain. And I think that that is what's missing from so much mainstream horror. Um, yeah. You know, it's sort of that that manipulation of empathy. Yeah. I think in a lot of horror, not that I really know much about it because I don't watch it, but a lot of horror is there's one person who you have sympathy for who isn't, a, you know, a jerk yeah. um, and is, you know, that the person who represents the audience. Yeah. Um, and everybody else is a jerk. And but in this movie, everybody is sympathetic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There there mm -hmm. aren't any horrible people, even even the drug addict. You know, through his dialogue, you come to love him. He's a hmm. he's a big goofball with serious problems. Yeah. Um, you know, and that whole he gave a whole speech in there about being an artist and how it fucks you up. And and, and that that broke my heart. Yeah. You know, mm. um, yeah. So does anyone have any criticism of The Endless? <laughs> hmm. No, I'll, I'll say like. My my really one substantive piece of criticism is that even watching it twice, I still don't understand why the people in the cult never explain to Justin and Aaron about the time loop thing and how they need they're going to be trapped here forever if they don't leave. Like it just seems like, um, you know, from the story point of view, you don't want to give that mystery away. Do they but, know it? Do the um, yeah, absolutely. The 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 cult people know about the time loop for sure. Yeah. What makes you believe that? Uh, well, I mean, I've heard the oh. filmmakers talk about oh, okay. it. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, um, you read the cliff you know, notes. Yeah. Well, well, it's established that the people remember, like, like when they when they talk to Shitty Carl, for example, like the the, the people remember that may uh, retain their memories from previous loops. You know, so. Um, yeah. Well, the the guys in the sh in the very short mm -hmm. loops, like the guy who hung himself, I can understand that he's figured it all out. But I mean, if this is like a basically like a, a long 10 year loop or whatever, I mean, have they I don't know. My sense was this was the first time this had happened. Uh, uh, first... I, maybe I'm wrong to, to the actual cult, like the big the big uh, loop. And that's no. why the the guy was still, well, I, I mean, I might have missed out on something, but I thought that was why he, I thought he was genuinely trying to figure something out with the, cal well, I guess he's trying to figure a way out of it with the calculation. Well, they have all this analog equipment, though, 
you know, that from decades past right. with stuff with the cult. So you feel like the cult has been oh, doing right. this. That's true. You know, That's true. Decade after decade after decade. However, I don't think that all of the characters are aware that they are, you know, including it's left rather open ended, whether the brothers are just in their own loop. I think they are. And even I think the directors uh, said in an interview that, you know, that if you want to answer that question, the, it's in the movie. You just have to pay attention. Okay. Hmm. Um, yeah, but no, this is actually quite clever because um, if, and I, I, I didn't pick up on this. I had to read up on it, but you know, um, Justin was afraid that the people were all about to kill themselves and that's why they left. And then they did. Right. And now then it repeated and now it's oh, 10 I years see. later and I then see. they're about to do it a, a, again. Right. Yeah. This is the, the repetition of it. Yeah. Oh, and that explains why. Okay. That all makes sense now. That That's why he thought everyone still looked so young. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because they're all the same age as when they left because they're, they're right. in, they've repeated right. everything again. Right, yeah. right, 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 right. Well, I was a little, uh, well, the girl, the um, the wife, the the Jennifer. The other loops seem to interact. Like shitty Carl goes through everything, but he's he's in his own loop. Um, so why can't why can't she find Mike? Like why hasn't she stumbled into that loop to find her husband? She may not be able to stay there, but she, I feel like she should have. I thought she was kind of in her own loop of horror, where she's just always going to be looking for what happened to her husband, but that she can't actually you know, cross over into his loop. Well, she does talk about how, what's the name of the guy, the laid guy in the, in the Mike. cult. Oh, uh, how? How? Um, she says something about how they they said they were going to help her find him. So she, I, yeah, I mean, there's a little uncertainty about that, that yeah. did, wasn't explained to me. But uh, again, it, I, I don't really, it doesn't bother me that mm -hmm. much it, it, this is me coming up with it afterwards you know right but the, my question about why doesn't why, why is there, everyone in the cult not explain because like you know everyone else that they meet like you mm -hmm. know in the loops is like oh we're stuck in this loop get out of here now and i don't understand why the people in the cult don't say that and i, I was wondering that the first time i watched the movie well maybe they want them to stay <laughs> Well, but this yeah. is, but this is, but they don't, it's, 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 it's a, this weird thing because if they wanted them to stay, like they, they do things that suggest that they don't want them to stay, but then they do stuff that suggests that they don't want them to leave either. So it's like, mm. that's why I'm sort of confused. Um, well, the only difference that I can see is that everyone else is definitely sort of trapped in the other minor loops against their will, but perhaps these people truly are a cult in as much as they're worshiping this power. Yeah. And so yeah. it's sort of like, yeah, that makes sense. hey, you know, what, what, once they're worshiping it, then it's sort of like, you know, it's almost like their form of proselytizing not to tell people about it because it's like reverse proselytizing by not telling you what's actually going on. You might get caught up in this as well. Mm -hmm. Well, there's also an element of you have to come to it yourself kind of thing, mm -hmm. which is very cult like, you know, come join us. But also you have to find your own truth. Yeah. Yeah, it totally actually reminded me of this one time that I went to vacation Bible school in the <laughs> summer when I was like, I don't know, 14 or something. And then, and it was like, you know, in the woods. So by the way, this, this movie could be super triggering for you if you had a crazy Christian upbringing, but they gave us like a, 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 a an envelope the first day of the, of this, of the camp. And we weren't to open it. We were supposed to keep it on our bodies the whole time. That that oh you know that the so we weren't to know what's in the envelope, but we had to like keep it with us at all times. <laughs> oh. And so some people like broke down and opened the envelope, and and some people lost it, and you know some people went through the wash and so on. And at the end, the envelopes were all empty. But the people <laughs> who had them on their body and hadn't opened them, they all got like a dollar each. And it was like some kind of crazy metaphor about, you know, <laughs> basically the people who opened the envelopes aren't going to heaven. <laughs> well, it was a metaphor for virginity, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I am. I went to Catholic school for 14 years and I, I was forced to go on a retreat once in somewhere in high school. And um, I, I am so anti i'm like not a joiner and i'm not a sharer so it was essentially torture for me <laughs> but they would you know they would make you do things like trust walks where you put a blindfold on and then some strange somebody comes up yep. and guides you around and of course some idiot walked me straight into a tree right. um 
So yeah, my trust was not not gained there. Yeah. So I, I feel the exact same way about groupthink and and <laughs> culty things like that. Yeah. So let me just throw this out there. I I feel like you're all going to laugh at me as you know, like I'm gonna laugh oh, at you, you anyway. <laughs> yeah, I know, you know, but but like you're going to basically say like, yeah, no, no kidding. Um, and maybe I'm just late to the party here, but I just happened to quickly pop up IMDb and for the first time realized that Aaron and Justin are played by Aaron Moorhead and Justin Benson. Yeah, the directors. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what Andrew was trying to tell you earlier. Oh, I was oh, trying oh, to I tell see. you you weren't listening. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> And they're really good. I mean, yeah, you know. yeah, they yeah. did it. I mean, yeah, they're very good actors. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I have to, and just from listening to interviews with them, I just like them so much. They just seem mm -hmm. like cool guys that I would want to hang out with. And yeah. one of the things that really impressed me is uh, one, one interviewer asked, you know, what movies really, um, you know, influenced you? And, and one of the things they said is, oh, it's actually like I would say we're more influenced by books. Um, and that that really impresses me. And this, this is the list of books that they mentioned, kind of as as influences. Um, just sort of well, like graphic novels is Alan Moore, um, mm. Color to Space by H.P. Lovecraft. We talked about. I have no mouth and I must scream by Harlan Ellison. Mm. Desperation yeah. by Stephen King and House of Leaves by Mark Danieluski. Um, so yeah, mm. just like really smart, interesting guys. Uh, yeah. very cool. But, you know, if you read the interviews with them, they're they're good friends and they work well together. Um, and they've been doing it for years. And that reflects in their films and in their dialogue that they they do relationships really well, um, yeah. especially between men, because all the dialogue between the brothers and between Mike and Chris is just like it, it's mm -hmm. real dialogue. They're real friends. They're having a real situation. Um, so that I think that probably comes out of their own friendship. They're, they're putting their own um ability to relate to other men within those characters and you you like them um i think that's maybe what it might have been missing for me from spring is that that camaraderie not broish camaraderie just real good <laughs> guys you although know? The, the relationship between evan and angelo is hysterical i mean yes yeah 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 um <laughs> but yeah it's actually like i agree with everything you just said Andrea, but it's actually surprising to me how long or, you know, how briefly they've actually known each other. I think they met in 2009 and they made um, resolution in 2013. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I would have thought they had known each other longer. I, I would have gotten the sense that they had known each other longer than that. Yeah, but that's one of those things where you, you meet somebody and immediately hit it off. You know each other. Um, yeah. I've, I've had that, re the, that experience with <laughs> people where, mm -hmm. you know. We immediately we we see the world from the same perspective, um, and it's an immediate connection. And there really doesn't have to be any kind of ramping up of the of the friendship because we speak the same language. I've had that uh, a lot. You know? Yeah, and then the the inverse of that, you know, I mean, sometimes you you know people for years and years and years and years, and then you know they do something that shocks you, and you feel like you never knew them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we mentioned Andrea that you've been, that you've been following them on Twitter. Have you picked mm -hmm. up any interesting tidbits uh, from? Twitter? Well, um, well, I know that they've gotten a new movie deal. They're going to make a bigger budget movie, um, with, and Anthony Mackie's in it and Jamie Dornan, which I'm really excited for. I think they've, mm -hmm. they're calling it like the sci-fi, psychological sci-fi, or something like that. Um, I don't know if the word horror was mentioned. As I said, I. Me and the <laughs> the word horror clearly don't get along. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm really excited to see that. Mm. Um, you know, I, they don't they don't tweet that much. It doesn't pop up on my feed all that much. Um, they just get they get a lot of people uh, coming to them from seeing the movies and then going, "Wow, these are this is amazing." And they're they're like really good guys. You know, they they acknowledge the people who tweet at them, um, mm. which I appreciate. You know, they don't ignore them. They're not jerks. It, it, it'll be interesting to me to see what they're able to do with the bigger budget, because I could see that going mm -hmm. one of two ways where either, you know, it's amazing or you're like, oh, actually, they're better at the lower budget, yeah. you know, in in that mode. Well, my feeling on that is that you make an indie film and you're the creator and you have creative license because you don't ha you're not beholden to anybody. The minute you make a studio film, you are beholden to a bunch of accountants and a bunch of mid-level studio executives who, you know, went to the, the Peter Stark uh, program at UCLA or UC, USC and then took a, a, 
a seminar, McKee seminar, and suddenly they think they're, you know, film geniuses. And then they start giving you notes and telling you what to do and you're beholden to them. Yeah. Um, and that's what I fear. I, I hope it doesn't go that way because they have a very clear voice and they know what they're doing. And I hope some dingbat 27 year old kid doesn't go, well, I think it should be this, you know, the like, intern that's now an executive. Yes, exactly <laughs> that. Exactly that. It was actually, I, I'm, I, I'm almost certain it was one of these interviews I just listened to with them where, where they told this story, but it was the story about the Coen brothers having a meeting with, you know, like with studio execs. And uh, it was for No Country for Old Men. Mm -hmm. And the, the studio exec gave all these notes. And the mm -hmm. Coen brothers were like, okay, we have two responses to this. And one is like, you're wrong because you're seeing this as a crime movie and it's not. It's a ghost story. Mm -hmm. And two, we're not actually interested in your opinion. Uh, <laughs> and if you don't want to make it the way that we want to make it, we're just going to leave right now. But that's mm -hmm. the Coen brothers. They have the power yeah, to do yeah, that. Well, sure, yeah. You know, um, I hope I, these guys, these guys can make it on their own. Clearly, um, you know, just from the perspective of somebody who has worked for networks and has to deal with network notes, it's it's hellish. You know, there's I come up with an idea and then, you know, the the marketing department's like, nope, can't do that. We might offend, a, 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 a you know, an advertiser. And it's like, well, you know, it's 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 art made by accountants. And that is my big problem with having to be beholden to a studio or to a, a an accountant or a marketer or something like that. So um, I hope they can re I hope they can push back on that crap. Yeah. And I, I just think this should be so inspiring to other filmmakers and aspiring filmmakers that you can make movies like this, like resolution for three thousand dollars or whatever. And, yeah. you know, have 92 percent on Rotten Tomatoes, you know, that mm -hmm. yeah. this is like a model for, for people, other people who want to yeah. do that. Well, yeah. Robert Rodriguez, is that his name? Robert Rodriguez yeah, made. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember the name of the movie he made on, you know, he bought a bunch of short ends of films and shot it on a $2,000 yeah, budget. Des was that it? I can't remember. Like ben it might have been Desperado. Antonio Banderas. It was something like that. Yeah, it was something like or that. El Mariachi. Um, mm. El Mariachi. Yes, yeah. that was it. Um, so, you know, it is doable if you're a good storyteller um, and you can make it. And, you know, he blew up after that. And then you suddenly he was doing stuff with Tarantino. As I recall, I think that's how it worked. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, I just hope they retain their independence um, and their creative independence because they're they're amazing storytellers, and that should be encouraged and not um, reined in by a bunch of idiots, stupid, <laughs> you know, executive. <laughs> By the way, did I mention I'm looking for a job? Because clearly this is the sort of rhetoric that is going to get me a million resume requests. <laughs> or, or it's the reason I'm unemployed. So, you know, <laughs> pick one. All right. So we're pretty much out of time. So maybe just the last word from, uh, so Chris, any uh, any final thoughts here on these uh, on these movies? I don't know. I mean, I think I said most of what I wanted to say about them. I just really enjoyed them. I, I think I'm so glad that I, uh, Took your advice and watched them. Yeah. Um, you should just, everyone should always take my advice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, I will, I'll also mention, it, it, speaking of the fact that it, they really didn't have any known actors, but the one actor I did know, who I was, I, I enjoyed seeing Zahn McLaren, who um, yes! basically yes! played the same character he played on Longmire, but he played, uh, you know, reservation security in this movie, and he played reservation yeah. police chief in the other movie. But... Um, He's great, and I yeah. love seeing him. He in. was also in that amazing episode of Westworld that was all yes. in. What was it? It wasn't in Cherokee. It was like I can't remember what language, what uh, Native American language it was. But that was the best episode of yeah. the entire season. I was I was in tears at the end yeah. of it, and he, he was amazing. He just, carried that just, thing like crazy. Yeah. So yeah, I I love that guy. I would he's, watch anything that guy's in. Yeah, he's, he's incredibly watchable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Sarah, final thought. Uh, just to, you know, that it's cool to sort of discover yeah, and be excited about whatever these guys do next. Like, you know, it's a genuine thing to be able to encounter something like this and have a very clear reasons why they are, what they're doing is very refreshing uh, in an industry that, you know, their number one problem with Hollywood is, you know, the, the lack of refreshment constant recycling of, of, of tropes and, and other such things. And it's really nice to, you know, see it a pair that uh, is doing good work and turning all of those tropes on their heads. And 
you know, so I'm very interested to see what comes out next from them. Yeah, absolutely. These movies are great. Everyone go check them out. And so we'll have to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Sarah Lynn Mishner, Chris Vasco, and Andrea Kale. So thanks everyone so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Bye. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Sarah Lynn Mishner, Chris Vasco, and Andrea Kale for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to Zach Chapman, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Kathleen Arbuckle, who just signed up to make regular monthly payments to the show via PayPal. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkertley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.